Good morning, everyone. This is the se September 7th meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee. October. And October, uh, good. Um, I'm <laughs> slightly jack lagged, so Margaret is going to help me all the way along the way. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> anyway, we are here on a Friday, and to call the meeting to order, when we have a quorum, I also need to make sure the people who have joined us can hear and be heard. And as people, others join us, I will announce them. Um, Jonathan. Good morning. Mike. I'm here, thanks. Ben. I am also here. Paul. Present. Angelica. Present. Sean. Here. And Simone. Here. So thank you. And I'm turning the meeting over to uh, Phoebe. I just met, let me make sure Phoebe can hear us and be heard. I hear Phoebe. Unmute. Phoebe, just let us know you can hear and her we can hear you. You're still yeah. muted. Yeah, she may not hear you quite yet. She was just joining. Are you talking to me? I'm sorry. I did not, I did not hear you, but I can now. Okay. <laughs> okay. We can hear you now too. Okay, so I'm going to turn the meeting over to Margaret, who will go over our fairly brief agenda, but part of what we want to make sure everyone knows, and I put it on today's agenda, is that we are starting next week, the in two weeks, the alternate meeting schedules so that Alicia can join us. Some of that just today in the agenda, but then we'll go to Donesco and have a just final preview of what we're gonna be doing at each of those meeting times. So Margaret, it is so, all you. Kathy, I apologize, but screen sharing is disabled. Can you or whoever's co-host fix that? Okay. I think, see if you're enabled now. You should yes, be. Yes, that worked perfectly. Thank you. Okay. And we're off. So um, I hope, I just want to recap the email I sent yesterday about future meetings. We'll go over it in a little more detail. But um, we did um, work, uh, the consultant team worked on putting together a sort of updated list, including getting all these alternating meeting times set and, up, and yesterday I updated all your meeting invites because it is harder to keep track of for sure. Um, I do, mo we want to spend most of the time today with Danisco giving updates on uh, what they've been doing. And I want to note that they're, <laughs> I would I'd say uh, they are really cooking along now and they're going to be, in addition to the design updates they're going to provide, they're going to recap several meetings that have been had with teachers, um, including a meeting with the art teacher, a really productive meeting with the traffic folks, and uh, conversations with the librarians, as well as general classroom teachers and technology. So they're, they are bringing today a lot of updates on all of those items. Um, and then as you can see, Thornton Thomas said he's gonna give an update on daylighting. So, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about a community engagement idea. I'm just gonna toggle to this that I sent, which is a memo that was posted in the packet, which is a summary of the email I sent out yesterday, which is um, showing you know, our, the layout of the meetings for the foreseeable future. At the last meeting here, the committee agreed to move to the later submission date for schematic design. And that has enabled us to kind of uh, anticipate some future meetings if we need them in December. Um, a couple big items to note is we are anticipating that this committee we'll be looking at the schematic design estimate on January 6th, right after the holiday. Um, and then there's been a preliminary discussion uh, at the town, at the city council level about when to take up the meeting votes uh, to reflect this. So just to note, um, there is a tentative date for a town council presentation on the project costs in January. 
um, there is a tentative date in early February for a town co council vote on the debt exclusion language and the referendum date. And the tentative date for the debt exclusion is actually May 2nd, which is falling just a week after the MSBA board vote. So those are not confirmed. Those are the dates that have been floated so far. So um, that's my kind of intro to today's meeting. I'm gonna just take that down and ask if anybody has any questions so I can see hands. Paul has a question. It's not a question, it's more of a comment to double emphasize that the council has not had this as a discussion. These dates, like the, the debt exclusion date is something that we've, you know, we, where it's being proposed, it could be any date in there um, before or after. And that's really a decision by the town, solely by the town council, not our decision. We we decide which MSBA meeting to, to shoot for, and then that lines up things. Um, they can have a debt exclusion any time before or after that. And and I at least tentatively it's on some Kathy, so your connection just, sounds wobbly. Tammy is with us. So Tammy, I just want to check that you can oh. my con your connection is a little much. wobbly. Do you want to try turning off your screen to see if that helps? Turning my screen off. Yeah, yeah. the sound. There you go. The sound quality is, it is better. Is, is it better power. with? Yeah. Is it better? It's okay. better. Okay. So, uh, I'm looking. I don't see any other hands I, on this. I think I think we we're just making sure Tammy can hear and be heard. Oh. Yes. Thank you. Thank Great. you. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to the Denisco team who have been really uh, burning the candle at both ends the last couple of weeks. So. Um, thank you. Um, actually, we're going to start with uh, Thornton Thomas Ali and Ermacker here to give a review of the daylighting analysis process. And then uh, after we have that discussion, we're going to move into how that informed the design, um, uh, among the other things we're going to talk about today. So uh, with that brief introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Ali. Tim, can you also introduce the, the because we met them in net zero, but not everyone else met them. Oh, sorry, uh, forgive me. Uh, so with us today from Thornton Tomasetti, uh, we have Ali and Ermak who are um, daylighting and overall energy specialists, and I will allow them to introduce themselves a bit better than I just did. Thanks, Tim. And just to clarify, it's just me, but I logged in with Ermac's oh. link. And so I showed up as Ermac first and I have turned into Ali, but I'm the same person. And so uh, this is, I'm Ali Minchaka. I'm a vice president in the sustainability practice for Thornton Tomasetti. And we have been doing some exciting work on evaluating daylight glare performance with respect to, uh, as it relates to facade options. And so I'll walk you a little bit through what we're doing. Um, and with that, can I share my screen? I'll try to figure out, uh, I guess I can just share my- If you go to the bottom of the yeah. screen and hit share yep. screen, and it'll play. Yep, it. yep, no, I'm allowed now. So screen two, share. And so then I'll do this and you should be able, I'm gonna turn off my camera just because I'll be looking up. Well, I can't, I don't even know how to turn off my camera on, the, on this menu. So, oh, there. Okay. Um, actually, I'll just even. Can you all see a slide and present review? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Fabulous. So, just a little bit of background because I think this is very important to the discussion we're going to have where we're playing with many metrics. Um, we are aiming, right, to provide as much daylight as possible within the school and in the classrooms in particular, which was the focus of our study, right? There is research that has proven that there are higher test scores in kids that are exposed to daylighting. So it's a no brainer there. We do wanna make sure, however, let me see. Oh, how do I not go next on my computer? It's frozen, there we go. That we control that daylight, right? Lots of daylight and there are many ways to quantify daylight that will just tell us you have lots of daylight but they won't tell us that a lot of that daylight comes from direct sunlight. When we have direct sunlight that actually 
decreases our performance, as you all know, right? Uh, we do not want to have direct sunlight that might impact a teacher's view or ability to connect with the classroom, but also a student's uh, ability to concentrate, right? And so just to put it in context, just because we'll be talking about this, the balance between daylighting, uh, why are my slides animated? Give me just one sec, let me undo that, just the slideshow, use timings for some reason, sometimes I have that happening. Okay, um, in order to highlight the relevance of discussing in particular fixed shading, uh, it's important to highlight that this is what, and this is in plan, imagine a classroom where this is the window right here, or an office, this is squared, it doesn't quite have the shape of a classroom, but this is the glass right here, daylight's coming in from here and filling out the space, right? This is what we typically model for lead, say, right? So we'll be modeling uh, how much daylighting is coming into the space, right? And this, this, this facade, hypothetical facade has no exterior shading and has no interior shading, right? Now, what happens? If we put fixed exterior shading, the amount of daylight that comes into the space is reduced minimally, right? This exterior shading, we need to define it for the right orientation, can help us eliminate, almost eliminate, eliminate as much, reduce, minimize as much as we can the direct sunlight that comes into the space, right? Think of baguettes or any type of exterior shading. If we do not have this and we opt to just go this way and deploy interior shades whenever they're needed, this is what the daylight profile is in the space. And this is actually a very optimistic shade because it's 5% open. These are interior blinds, right? And so I just wanna remind everyone that whenever we talk about the fact that there might be interior, that there, there might be direct sunlight in a space, that that will most likely mean that the daylight profile in that space will look much more like this. And I should have said, this is daylighting where yellow means good daylight, maximum amount of daylight that we can have and you know, when it's when the sun is out, blue is the minimum amount, right? And so I just wanna make the point of the fact that whenever we anticipate having glare, the likelihood of a classroom looking like this is very high as opposed to this, which is what we tend to model for, you know, say from a lead standpoint, which we've talked at large about lead and why it might not necessarily be the best metric, although it's one of the useful metrics. So. Uh, without getting into too many details, I'll just walk you through uh, the analysis we did. What we did is called the parametric analysis. So we looked at various, uh, all combinations of many of many design options. And so we have classrooms looking south and north. Uh, so we looked at that, various shading depths. And so we only considered at this point one type of shade. And this might look like the shade is going all across, but in reality, these would be, you know, in reality, these would be tiny brows on the, on the, on a window, but three different shape depths, and then various window configurations, right? There are some window configurations. People tend to think wide and really high up should bring more daylight in. Uh, we have you know, addressed that. We have looked into it many times and we'll show the results for that. But the design team really went all out in exploring what, what window configurations would align with our architectural intent and can we evaluate those? And so what we did uh, was look at all possible combinations of the options that I showed you earlier and measure various things. And so this is in color here. This is, these are not the results for this. This is just an example. Uh, daylight, annual daylight availability is what you see here represented as I, what I showed earlier, where our target really is to be somewhere above 50%. And we also quantify the depth of uh, daylight penetration that we have found is much easier for people to understand uh, as a single metric is like how many feet of daylight am I getting as opposed to a particular percentage. So we're showing both. Um, this is what we uh, qualify, quantify as glare potential. This, these are hours of direct sunlight at desk height, right? And so this space in particular that we had model had four different windows and what you can see is number of hours of direct sunlight along the space. And so, our results have this graphical output, but we're also quantifying what percent of this area has two or more hours uh, under glare. And so I'll, I'll walk you a little bit more through the metrics as we go. And we're looking at three, it's very, very critical when we're looking at potential glare to split them up by seasons because the winter is inevitably has low, they're low sun angles and the sun inevitably comes really deep in. And if we were to average over a year, 
that would actually be washing out in a way, right? It would get averaged out and we wouldn't be seeing the impact of summer light coming in so deep. And then finally, we're looking at various ways of quantifying heating and cooling this early in design. So looking at annual heating load, cooling load, do any of these configurations impact that? And then solar gain in the space. Um, and the solar gain in the space, just to clarify, do, uh, gonna, uh, is basically how much is solar gain reduced with respect to, uh, to the baseline without shading. And so for each window configuration, we're comparing how much is the shade doing. Uh, and with that, I'll walk you through the outputs. So because we looked at all possible combinations, the results look like this web of lines. So I'll just quickly walk you through it and really just want to walk you through like how we're exploring so that then the design team can, I'll tell you just our big findings, right? I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, on the left, we have orientations. So I mentioned north and south, different shape depths, so zero one and a half feet, three feet, and then all the various window options here. These are the inputs. These are all the possible combinations we looked at. And then the outputs would be the average depth of daylight penetration, then how much glare there is in the summer and in the equinox and in the winter, as you can start to see, well, I'll, I'll tell you what the lines mean, heating, cooling, and then relative peak gain. So these are the metrics that I mentioned we would be, we would be uh, comparing these options against. Each one of these lines represents one simulation. So if I pick, I'm just going to pick this, for instance, this line corresponds to a north orientation. Well, north is, is we had to model. You, you would tell me it doesn't make much sense to model north with shading. And, and that's true. This is just a, the, the methodology of how we do it. Um, but this is, this is more useful. So this line, for instance, would look at, uh, I think if I click on it, I can a south orientation without shading option window configuration number five uh, for windows and this these are the outputs that i'm getting right really high depth of daylighting you know this is you know glare glare how it compares to the others well it's pretty high in all seasons uh low and heating load because it's south facing and it's getting a lot of sun so it doesn't need to heat up that much high on the cooling load and then um and then how it compares. So uh, I'll, well, let me walk you through just the graphics very quickly. So for this particular scenario, and this is again, just to show you the graphics, and I think we'd be happy to you know, share this link if, if that's useful, but this is what the direct sunlight looks like at um, in the summertime, right? And so when we look at glare and when we quantify, well, how challenging would be to control the sun in this orientation at this particular time of the year, you see that most of the sun, this is again from zero to four hours, is falling very close. So this would be maybe four feet within four feet of the perimeter, right? Still, still not insignificant, uh, but very close to, um, to, to the facade. If we now move to the equinox, you'll notice that the sun is starting to move deeper into the space, right? And so you're starting to have, if you're going to have students sitting here, uh, we also modeled, uh, looked at glare on the teaching surfaces in case, you know, just to understand what it looks like along the walls. You start to see that this direct sunlight starts to impact, might start to lead the desire to, to pull shades down, right? And this final one, this is the winter time, right? inevitably the sun angles are very low right and so the depth of penetration of sunlight is like half of the classroom right this is for a scenario without shades let me try to find i'll pick the same example with shades just to show you what it would look like and you'll start to see what that shade for the moment is doing, right? So now we've added this shade to the same example and you see that in the summertime, we're almost eliminating all direct sunlight, right? Uh, in the equinox, meaning shoulder season, September 21st, March 21st, um, we are eliminating some of it, but probably not enough to say the shades will not need to be, the interior blinds will not need to be drawn down, right? 
And then in winter time, once again, this is peak of winter, right? The solar winter, so December 21st, just the sand angles are so low that, you know, it's just really challenging to control the, 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 the sunlight, right? And so we typically anticipate that it would, with really low sun angles, classrooms inevitably will need to have their shades down at some point of the, of the day uh, and daylighting will be impacted. But what we're trying to focus on is how can we minimize that time where the interior shades are down? Because we also know that once shades are down, it's really hard to bring them back up because they're manual, right? And so that requires a commitment to bring them back up. Um, any questions on this? This is really just to show you the methodology and I'm gonna go back to the presentation and just show you our, big, our, our main findings, but just wanna make sure that there are if there are any questions or comments on this before I, I move back to, um, to my PowerPoint and walk through the last slides. I don't see any. People should just raise their hand because I'm not necessarily gonna see them. I don't see any hands up. All right. Okay, so I'll go back to, um, to the deck. Yes, questions, no? Okay, I heard a sigh. So these are the key findings. And so with all of this web of results, there always is a time that we take to go through each one of them and really identify what the cross effects are between having, you know, between having shading versus not having shading versus the different window options, et cetera, et cetera. What is the impact on the various metrics? It's lots of information, it's very useful for, designers who want to play a little bit more with them, but we also do the job of summarizing. And so we've identified, and Daniska will address more how they've taken these results, incorporating them in the design. But what we did was through this analysis, we identified which um, of the window layouts were, um, were the best from a daylighting standpoint, right? Um, and so those are highlighted in, in light teal, and then which of the, the options are the best from a glare control standpoint, right? And so we've listed them here. And so there's some that are clearly better, but that might perform, you know, that depending on whether they're, you know, shades and how deep they are might perform differently. Um, this is very simplistic because again, the combination of each one of these variables can get very complex. Um, just, I should say big picture, this is lots of text, but overall, I'll just say along the north, there's no surprise, right? Along the north, no direct sunlight, no exterior shading should be used, um, you know? And so you, choosing the right option to brings as much that window configuration that brings as much daylight as possible is what the team should be focused on. Um, all spaces under all configurations will have roughly anywhere between 15 and 22 feet of daylight depth, right? And so none of them will really have the full depth. This is standard. This is what we see in typical classrooms um, is just, you know, daylight only penetrates about two times the window height. And so, you know, 15 feet is 15 to 20 feet is what we anticipate seeing. And then along south orientations, and this is assuming the shades interior blinds are not drawn down, right? And the moment interior blinds are drawn down, we get almost zero. And then along the south, we've made recommendations in particular with regards to various window options and uh, in, in what that relates to. I'm not gonna walk you through each one of them, right? Uh, but obviously, you know, options that have higher daylight penetration also have a higher risk of glare because that those higher daylight levels actually came from direct sunlight measurements or simulation. Um, and, uh, and this is it. And so I'm going to stop sharing. If there are any questions, happy to address them. But otherwise, I'm going to pass it to Dennis going to talk about how they've processed these, these results. Kathy, do you have your hand up? I'm going to let Margaret share this because I'm raising my hand. <laughs> you went quickly through that. Thank you. Um, so you're balancing the light on different sides of the building differently. Um, then you had a heat and a cooling. Yeah. Throughout that, are you assuming all these windows are double glazed? 
that yes we are assuming yeah well i would need uh, I, I actually have the the u values we typically look at assembly u values let me check but we typically assume uh a we we're looking at right now what we assume this triple pane it's an assembly u value of 0.2 but the results comparatively would probably not be that different if we were looking at we haven't refined that yet and so this is not necessarily an exercise to look at window u value um but if we were to if we had changed it by something else simply all the results would have shifted a little bit right and so we'll get to focusing on window u value in specific uh but the assumptions for this specific model are uh is an assembly u value of 0.2 so okay so the reason I like, asked, uh, yeah mm -hmm. okay so so with that if we look at the energy side of the building um mm -hmm. and i don't know anything about all of this so that's what i want to preface to this is just a real lay person that um the glazing of the window or the mm -hmm. fact that there's sunlight coming in yeah. the amount of window all affects the energy and Absolutely. you're trying to balance all of that correct, That's correct. Um, yeah. as you're as you're giving advice and then the designers are saying taking all of that this is what we think the windows should look like is and so you've also got the, the um, energy efficiency of the building in that equation that you're modeling no so the okay. so to a certain degree so the shoebox model is really looking at loads and i should have been more specific so thank you for thank you for bringing that up so we're looking at loads and loads for the moment are how much this how many watts does that space need of heating and how many watts do we need to remove of cooling in particular times of the year that does not directly translate into energy because depending on the HVAC system that we pick and how we recover energy, those values might change. And we're not there yet in terms of that. And so all we're looking very simplistically uh, is we're trying to compare really what is the impact on daylight and everything else, but we don't wanna lose sight of the fact that some of these might in some way impact heating or cooling. And so we're using very simple proxy metrics to quantify heating or cooling. To your point, we try to keep this analysis kept somewhat constant the window to wall ratio, but not perfectly, right? Uh, if we had kept, if, if the window to wall ratio were identical in all the configurations, I could have told you, well, that the difference between one and the other is exclusively due to a, you know, a, you know, the, the, you know, the, the impact of the shading, for instance, on the heating or on the cooling. Uh, these options were slightly different, each one of them. So there's a few options that have a little bit more glass and a few options that have a little bit less glass. And so that's being reflected in the heating as well. Um, all this to say, we will be looking at impact of U-value and window to wall ratio. Uh, that was not the main purpose of this analysis, but we kept these metrics not to lose sight of the fact that these variables might be impacted by how we evaluate daylighting. Alejandra, can I kind of try to summarize what I think your process Please sounds do. like? Please do. Please do. I it's you in the basis of design. There's an assumption about how many, how much window, yes. how much wall, and that's based on a very preliminary judgment about yes. how to get to the energy performance. Mm -hmm. Then Danisco developed a series of options to look at daylighting at the same time you ran a model to look at the daylight glare. Right. Now you're gonna, I think one of the next steps is Nesco is gonna show us what that means in terms of what are the best window options. And then there'll be another cycle of going back and adjusting the best one for the energy performance. That is correct. Yes, thank you so much. And the tool we will be using for energy performance is a full building energy model. This is a shoebox model that isn't necessarily taking advantage of the fact that you might have, say, cooling on one side of the building and heating in the other, and they talk to one another and they're efficient, right? This is a very inefficient shoebox right now that we're looking at. So we're really just looking at this. And so, yes, the yeah. energy model itself will give us a much clearer picture of what the energy profile will look like. But what's good about this process, given what we've heard in the community, is you've you've started with the daylight piece. Yes. But you could start with a different starting point, but you started with the daylight analysis where you might, in another situation, choose to start with another. It's a, it's a starting point that's gonna go in a circle. 
That's correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other hands. So um, Alondra, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, do you, are we turning it back now to Tim and Vivian and Rick? Is that the next step? That, excuse me, that is the next step, unless there's something, uh, any more questions you'd like to ask or have answered before we move on? I have a feeling. Well, a question, is Alejandra staying for the rest of the presentation or is she gonna be dropping off? I believe I will, she. I will be staying. Okay, because I could imagine as we go into what the Denisco team is gonna present there, we might kind of end up coming back for a question with Alejandra. So thank you, Alejandra, that's helpful. Okay, Tim, the floor is yours. Great, um, so now we're gonna move into the implications of what that means for the architecture. Um, share. Can you see the elevations on the screen? It looks it flipped. To be bigger. <laughs> we we can only like see the thumbnails. A little window. <laughs> it's, hmm. One second. I'm gonna start this over. <laughs> That should be better. Yes, much better. <laughs> Sorry. Too so looking through um, the fenestration geometry that was uh, diagrammatically shown in Ali's presentation, uh, here is uh, a series of base studies that show those windows as, as windows uh, articulated in the facade of a building. Uh, we went through several options that broke it up um, to large windows, small windows, windows that were higher across the top that would bring light deeper into the room, um, similar to what we saw when we walked through the Sunita Williams School in Needham, um, just because it was observed that there was a, a good quality of light in those classrooms, similar to this. Um, but there was also an issue with glare, um, which we saw with uh, a lot of shades pulled and a lot of opaque treatments or semi-opaque treatments on the windows at Sunita Williams and, and shades pulled. Um, and that was backed up by the analysis that Alan did. Um, so there are several options here uh, that correspond and I, we won't even show you all of the ones that we've done, but the result of those studies and the back and forth that we've had with uh, Tom Setti is that a series of punched windows evenly distributed across the facade that go from the sill height, which is about two foot eight, to the ceiling that we can achieve uh, by articulating the ceiling plane and putting it up gives us the best amount of daylight. Um, you know, we are also weighing other factors, the amount of glass that we can reasonably use within a classroom to achieve the overall building window to wall ratio we want. Um, but with this organization of windows and solar shading on the south side of the building, that gives us the best option to get daylight deep into the room and to control glare. And this is the option that we're moving in the direction of. And you'll see when we, a little bit later in the presentation, as we show the whole building, what this means in terms of the facade. This is similar to the elevation that we were reviewing in the design subcommittee last week. And there's some minor refinements in terms of shading and detailing on the south side that we will look at as we move through the presentation.
We also looked at materials. Um, I'm just so kind of as Margaret alluded to before, we've been doing a lot and we're going to cover the bases and then sort of wrap up the discussion with um, a model of the building that we can walk, fly around and see all of the pieces that are moving in one place. Uh, and that's generally where we've had the most conversation. So we're going to talk a little bit about materials because we did talk about that specifically last week in the subcommittee. Um, so we just want to show some samples that of the direction of the masonry that we're moving in. Just as a reference point, here is uh, the Hastings School again with a red brick and uh, a porcelain panel at the third floor, uh, some ground-faced CMU on the first floor, and then we brought some of the samples to look at. Uh, actually, I'm going to go to the material palette that we had in the courtyard at the middle school last week. And I don't know, Vivian, if you want to talk about the colors and what we want to do with them. Yeah, sure. I think um, just as a little bit of background, I, the images that we had been showing, we were trying to keep fairly muted just because the way that our software renders is not really a 100% accurate uh, rendition of the actual material. So um, our goal for the building is, and, and this is what we've been talking about for the past couple of design subcommittee meetings actually is, does it make sense for the building to be a red brick, which is very institutional? Um, you see a lot of red brick in the town and within the town, or do we want to do something a little bit different that would really help kind of shepherd the building into a new era, right? We wanted this to be really special, still evoke um, school, have the scale of a school and particularly as um, we look at the entry sequence. We want we wanted to bring the scale down so that you know there are a lot of young children here. It's it's very. Um, we want to make sure that the school is is really scaled to these kids. So we also wanted to introduce bright colors too because this is a place for kids and it's exciting and it's fun. So when we start looking at the color of red, we we find that we wanted a palette. We want a, a masonry unit that is a little bit more neutral that would allow us to bring more colors, bright colors in without it fighting the red brick. So this is kind of where we're landing. And, and we talked a lot about the fact that you know most of our schools are masonry um, or mostly masonry. It is a really durable material and have beautiful, I mean, the way we treat it can be really beautiful. Um, and there are many different colors to it. So while we make the building primarily masonry, we are then able to introduce other materials to uh, really break up the scale. So that's kind of our goal is majority might be masonry. We treat it in a way that's light, if that's possible, which is kind of our goal for the Hastings School, which is um, one of the first couple of images that Tim had shown. Um, and then we look at ways to break it up and then bring the color in. So where we're kind of going and what it seemed to be as, as we left the meeting last Friday is that everyone seemed to agree that, yeah, maybe we don't want to do red brick. We, we really want to do something different and special. And so the, the brick, um, the palette that you just saw is a, an iron spot brick. So it has a flex of iron, which gives it a beautiful reflective quality. And Tim's got some other images of buildings that have been completed that I think give you a better sense of what it might be. So um, it's, very, it's very cool because as the sun moves around the building, the color of the building kind of changes. But you'll see that it still remains, it's a, it's a very deep, rich color. Um, with some reflectivity. And in some, you know, some some orientations it'll appear darker, uh, but mostly as the, the light hits it, it feels a little bit light. And so these are some images that we found to help um, show how a larger expanse of this iron spot looks on a building as opposed to a cardboard panel. So that's kind of the background. Um, we then went through and looked at the building and looked at, as Tim said, 
how the windows might look. We are still looking at the north versus the south orientation and treating those a little bit differently, but we still want the building to be a whole, right? So every part of it really needs to relate to each other. Um, and so we wanted to share what we shared last week and then some of the tweaks that we made um, in response to the meeting and also in response to the, the study that um, Ale and her team had done. So Tim, I, do you wanna, are there any questions? So far? Um, actually, Vivian, I have one that's a little off topic. I'm, I'm just realizing, look, looking at the screen, that the folks who came to the design subcommittee, I think were introduced to Benny M. But oh, yeah. Who the rest of the committee was. So you Let's might stop screen sharing for a second. Yeah. Tim, I, that, I just... You know, when you talked about introductions, I was going to say, hey, wait. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> so let us introduce the rest of the Denisco team. Um, Biniam Shafral Wei, he's at the office here with me. Biniam's been really instrumental in um, forwarding the design. So we're all working collaboratively to listen, to hear, and to address some of the more specific comments so that this building really is um, responsive, right, to what we're hearing. So Biniam, Tim, and Rick are here from Denisco Design. And Kathy, did you have a question? I just, I had a question comment so that the committee members who were not at the design meeting, um, when we were looking at those bricks outside, they looked really different than what you're showing us right now. Um, mm -hmm. They had these red flex, flex in them because we were a little worried that the gray would be too cold a color on a gray day. Then yeah. I think you also told us, you know, this is, we can make some tentative decisions. And if we decided to go back to ye old red, um, <laughs> now, and ye old red, you showed us lots of variations on red brick. So not red brick yes. wasn't always the same. So I just wanted to say that we were leaning in a, the, the direction you're about to show us, but that we could see that it, it really made a difference when you did those little accent colors that everyone can see these little stickers. And you're gonna show us what you, sh what I um, imagine you're showing all of us is when you add those blue strips or those red strips, yeah. um, everything looks different, regardless right. of whether you're using a red brick building or a, uh, iron spot building. So I just wanted to let people know where it's a look of the building and also the physical the physical mass of the building that we've been looking at. Okay, that's it. Yes, the comment thank you, rather Kathy. Than a question. Yeah. No, that's actually that's really great because um, you know we we're so immersed in it. Sometimes we don't take the time to realize. Oh well, we should explain more, right? Uh, Paul, did you want to say something before I? Yeah, I, I know there are, there are no stupid questions, but this may be the exception. Um, does the color or the glaze of the brick impact any energy energy usage or anything like that? Is that should that be is that a consideration in the at all? No, um, I think Tim tried to explain at the design meeting our backup. Um, so the brick is a veneer, right? So it's not a solid. Um, two feet of masonry. It's really um, the construction behind the brick is the same as the construction behind any of the other rain screen products like the porcelain panel. So the answer is no. Um, that said, a rain screen product does give more air movement behind that um, that layer and so that does kind of help a little bit in terms of the energy performance so i don't know how measurable it is and ali i don't know if you uh, you know i think it, it gets pretty technical but what we understand is that it does um the rain screen does help that said the rain screen also is a much more expensive um system so again we we're trying to balance beauty energy efficiency and cost. Sean? I mean, Paul, one way to think about it is the existing building just has is an uninsulated, uninsulated, the existing schools are an uninsulated brick wall. So it does make more of a difference in the existing buildings. It will make less of a difference, but it's also true there's more solar gain on 
the south and the north, which is going to be mitigated by these other issues. But the solar gain, Denisco team, correct me if I'm wrong, is really from the glazing, not from the brick. Yes. That is correct. Sean has actually it's yeah. not first of all, it's not a stupid question. I have a related question. Is there with the the glaze more glazed surface than the kind of unglazed brick that they have on the schools now is there more there must be more reflectivity into the environment correct so um, you know, i think you can see that from those photos i think there is but um it's very different than say the reflection from a white pvc roof yeah for instance right um it's, it's just a little bit different because again the value of that is pretty deep so even though it's got some re reflectivity it's not like you're going to be seeing um massive solar glare so sorry i think i interrupted sean no no it's okay um just so i apologize if this was already shown is the plan for this brick to go over the whole building or just accents um that that has not been shown today yet but we are about to get to that Okay. Yeah. I might just personally put as I think um, I could see it being accents, but I felt like the the pictures you showed where it was like a whole wall of it, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it did kind of seem like it could be dark, especially if it gets wet and, um, and you know, it's a gray day. It seems like it could be very dark. Um, I would say that, well, we'll let Tim get into it, but let me just talk a little bit about what the materials are that you see on the screen. So the little color chiclets up on the top are actually the glazing. The, um, we're considering glazed concrete masonry units. And that's what these big squares of bright green and blue are. So it's just, um, really, it's, it's great because there's so many different colors and they can actually customize the color. So we're considering using these units in some areas, which is pretty cost effective and more um, or less expensive definitely than metal panel. Um, so that said, when Tim gets into the 3D and the views of the elevations, Tim, you can talk about where we could consider using the masonry versus metal panel or vice versa. Um, the porcelain panels are, again, a rain screen uh, material where they are mounted on the building with a pretty extensive framing system. Um, the alternative to that is to also use a brick a lighter color brick to um, provide that contrast on the upper level. So we're still looking at that, but um, this is where there's going to be more cost implications. If we if we hear you say, you know, we really love the look of the porcelain because it feels lighter, let's price that out as part of our SD estimate. Or we're concerned, let's price, you know, I think we have the opportunity to price different options um, and, and we'll get to that. Tim, do you wanna show, I, do we have an, I think we had an image showing the brick also, the light brick, as opposed to the porcelain. Um, do we not the, show that one? The, the building image you showed us last week had the light brick on the, what the, right. the third the third floor wasn't the same as the other floors. Yeah, I think it was the light brick, and I'm wondering if um, we we do not have uh, okay with with the pewter. No. Yeah. All right. Well, I think the three Ds can kind of explain it. Phoebe's hand is up. Hi, Phoebe. Hi. No, I was just gonna say. Um, maybe if we explain that sort of the the other color was closer to that little gray square in the bottom corner mm -hmm. um, so that people could see the contrast so that they would be, the building wouldn't be all the dark. It would be uh, both that, that, you know, potentially be both that darker gray as well as that light, you know, square in the bottom left-hand corner. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh Maybe we should just move to uh, the 3D so that we can see the materials in context. Uh, there are some other, you know, things that we wanted to talk about in terms of a plan and site plan, but well, we can quickly go through. As Margaret mentioned in the introduction, we are continuing to have meetings with uh, users 
Um, we don't have any documents from them because they're in development. Uh, but just to recap, we met with the art teacher uh, or one of the art teachers. We so we are have a little bit more information about how to detail their space. We met with uh, several of the grade level teachers uh, and we have a survey out to them that asks all sorts of questions in terms of classroom technology, whether they want their desk built in or as furniture, what they have in terms of storage needs. Um, so when we get that, that'll give us a lot of information that we'll need to design the fit and finish of the classrooms. Um, and then we also had a very productive meeting last week um, with Rupert and Guilford, the town engineer, uh, about the site. Um, and then I'll just put the current site plan on the screen for reference. Uh, but this is also not updated, but it is somewhat updated in 3D when we get to that in just a minute, uh, where everyone seems to want to get. Um, we're we're going to take a different approach to the site circulation with two separate entrances, both entrance and egress. So cars, and staff parking would all come in at the north exit. Buses, vans, service would all come in at the south so that and those two loops would be largely separated in that and um, come, come in and exit. Come so in and exit. Yes, the entrance so, entrances and exits for, for mm -hmm. vehicle for cars and buses and vans are are separated. And this was directly a suggestion of the traffic folks in response to the concerns we've heard about uh, traffic. Uh, kind of, you know, on the adjacent, very busy street. Mm -hmm. Mike's hand is up. Mike. Yeah, and if I could jump in on this one, um, thank you. Uh, you brought this. The Indigenous Go team brought it to um, Lori, who's one of our transportation coordinators, uh, who drives a bus, uh, which is a much better opinion than me. But me, uh, Tammy, and Julio over at Fort River yesterday, and you know, all of us had the same reaction, which is separating buses and vans and trucks from cars was a really important safety uh, feature of this new plan. It also had the other um, positive of moving the building, uh, having the potential anyway to move the building a bit further. I think it's south. I'm going to say, yeah, we've got a compass on there. That's awesome. South, um, which you know provided more opportunities to think differently or, or think more expansively about uh, play space because it opens up a bit. Uh, one of the other things we noticed walking around with Donna yesterday is the the entrance uh, avoids some of the large curve that currently happens. Um, so. I don't know, I can't do it from my screen, but if you look at the entrance for buses and vans, I don't know if you use the right. So it's it's a much straighter path right now. There's a big uh, left-hand turn kind of curve uh, and the the car driving very much mimics our middle school uh, parking lot, which has worked very well for us uh, from a safety and design perspective. Um, so, you know, thank you for, you know, Guilford, Rupert, Rupert's not on this call today, he's, he's out of town. Um, and Jason over at the town, because, you know, kind of, I, I think I could speak for, I mean, certainly Tammy's on the call, she could speak for herself, but I think we all felt much more comfortable moving forward with the model that kept those separated. Uh, you know, I see the road is connecting them in this model. It's a little different than the hand-drawn one yesterday, but uh, I think the more we can do to uh, separate those, I'm not picking on it, Tim, I'm just saying, nope. you know, when we were talking about <laughs> it, it had more of a barrier set up uh, yeah, or no, like that connection. That uh, is an outdated plan, and we're about to move to a model that, uh, but it's a little bit hard to grasp from my level. So uh, I just wanted to introduce it there and say it was different. And then you, you might also wonder when we start showing the model why we're approaching from a different direction. So. Okay, sorry to get ahead of you, Tim. I just wanted yeah. to thank you all for being creative and thinking of different, uh, working with the town to think of different solutions. And the bus driver perspective was, is, again, the most important one. And she had lots of positive things to say about kind of the models and, and the improvements it would have on traffic flow and safety, so. Thanks, Mike. So I, I'm going to share the, uh, the video now, the, the 3D model. And while he's sharing that, Mike, was it one bus driver or, or several, just for the notes? Well, Rupert was there, and so Rupert is the head of you know transportation facilities, mm -hmm. but uh, we were with Lori, who she's, I mean, she does drive the buses, but she's also has a broader role that she's the point person for, uh, one of the point, two point people for transportation and has a many, many years experience, not just 
driving buses, but also doing creating routes. Um, so, you know, we love all our bus drivers, but Lori's expertise is on the high end of that. Right. Ben can hopefully agree with me there. I don't know if other people in his office can hear it, and, uh, but um, but yeah, uh, but yeah, she, she her level of expertise and experience, not just in this district, she's relatively new to this district, but in general uh, is very, very high. Great, thank you. Um, so, now we're going to look at the building in 3D and you'll notice the approach is through the parking lot. We just happen to be starting in the middle of the parking lot coming south under the solar canopies. Uh, so this path that you're taking will generally mimic the path that a car approaching the building will take. So there will be a turn in the in the main drop off loop that deposits uh, you right in front of the um, front door. Um, you know, traffic will have to be managed. You'll want cars with parents driving to pull forward um, so that there is congestion right at the door. But this is uh, certainly a manageable project problem, and and um, the separation of the bus and car traffic is, is definitely a benefit that makes that worth it. But this is. The main view that people will see of the building as you approach in a vehicle on site. Um, in the past, we've been showing it a little bit to the south from the south entrance of the site. Um, so the perspective will be changed a little bit. Um, most, Kathy, you have. Hand no, up. keep talking. Keep talking. I'm waiting for. Just don't move off the front yet. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so the the the, 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 the changed approach to the building will um, vary your perspective a bit. We've shown some images in the past where the the gym is sort of the first thing you see and and might be an opportunity for um, art, mural, some sort of identity piece. Um, as the approach shifts in order on the site, uh, you know, the thing that you will see first will be the music room or the slope of the roof at the lobby that speaks to entrance. Um, and so just as we're evolving our thoughts where we're going to put signage, art, any sort of um, moment that uh, speaks to the identity of building, it, it, it may be less on the gym and it might be more on the music room. And it, we also talked about um, putting it in the space between um, the slope of the roof to the right of the window that you see here. So that's the only thing I want to say, Tim, um, as you did your cursor last Friday, we came up with, uh, we could do a naming of the school. It could be the Fort River School or we could do a town-wide, give the school a name. And over where his cursor was that white slanted, not quite triangle, you could also have some kind of drawing there. We were just saying, you know, what would make the front really outstanding? And then the other thing, you know, just to answer what Sean was saying, we were still at like, should it be this green in front? Um, would some of Vivian's accent colors go through that brick on either side, you know, the dark? So we were looking at this with what else could be on it rather than final, um, which made it feel very exciting um, with, with and, and the white, I think you told us was CMU, not, it was what your designer had put in, it was the less expensive material, I think, the lightest of it, is that correct? I, I'm not quite sure, because we were trying to figure out how could we make it beautiful, but not spend a lot of money, mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Uh, I believe right now, given that this is a small area, it's rendered as the porcelain panel, but yeah. all of these can be any of the material because the backup is the same. It's it's a question of which material we want to use as an accent, which we like better, which does the best job. And obviously, money is always a concern. Um, so, you know, we're, we are working hard to develop a composition we like, um, a direction of where there should be accents, where there should be the field. Um, and then as we refine the design, we can tweak what the actual materials are in each location. There are a lot of opportunities for color. Um, as, you know, Kathy said, this might not be the right color for the canopy, but it is an opportunity to mark entrance to draw your eye. We also have the doors um, with a bright color here, which um, 
is a, a technique that is used on some of the existing schools and is rather effective. Um, I'm just going to pull around a little bit. We're showing signage on the music room now, but obviously that could be in the space that Kathy just mentioned or elsewhere on the building. Um, Tim, just because Paul has asked this question, for what time of day is this model for right now? This is the morning. This is about drop off. Okay. Jonathan's hand was up and it went down. Uh, <laughs> that was exactly what I was going to ask. I was going to point out that, that this was the morning uh, for folks. As we move to the north side of the building, um, you can see the cafeteria, the library above. Um, we are looking at ways to design the fenestration in the library that will um, deal with sort of the west facing nature of some of it, um, but with the sense that yes, there is glare to control, but it's also a library and the occasional bit of dramatic lighting in certain areas may not necessarily be a bad thing. Um, cafeteria with doors to the playground. And we'll continue to move around. Tim, can you show people where the stage would be in the cafeteria just with your cursor? Yeah. So the stage would be just to the right of this entrance to the cafeteria. So if you were to go through the glass, that would be the cafeteria proper with the service lines in the back. And then if you made a turn as you went in the door, the stage would be right at your right. And you have a plan that the music room, which is over on the flat part, could enter onto the stage from the room, yes? Or they'd go out and come in? Mm -hmm. uh, so the plan currently shows three practice rooms in between the platform, the stage, and the, and the music classroom oh. proper. Um, because there are several distinct music programs that exist in the district. There's band, chorus, orchestra, and then the general music education, the, the music classrooms won't be directly off of the general music classroom, which is often how it's done. Uh, but since it, you need access from other programs while, while there might be a music class in session, uh, we have a corridor between the stage and the music classroom that would allow you access to each of those music practice rooms. And then we've also discussed, uh, there are ways of making the stage itself uh, an additional music uh, practice room by uh, putting an operable, not soundproof, but sound resistant uh, at the stage opening. So just to increase the program area that could be used. So now we are getting to the full north facade where you can see um, the pattern of the uh, classroom windows that we're moving in on the north facade, they do not have any sun shading on the exterior. Um, you can see where we've integrated uh, accent panels uh, currently of the colored masonry that we showed in the, in the, in the material photographs. Um, and also the facade as a whole, you can see where the darker masonry material is on the first and second floor. Uh, the third floor is the lighter material. And then we also bring a lighter material to the base in certain areas uh, just to break up the darker masonry even further. So it's about two thirds brick, one third porcelain panel plus other materials, roughly. roughly. Yeah, that's about right. And can I just ask if the one third that's porcelain was CMU, do we get that pale color or is it a darker color? The, the brick manufacturers can't really get as light as the porcelain okay. colors. And they also are, they have a little more pigment in terms of it being a little more yellow or more gray. So. We're still looking for some of those lighter colors. So hopefully, um, you know, we can at least share some images of buildings with a lighter color and you'll see that 
I think from far away, they look pretty light. Um, and in comparison to the iron spot, they'll look pretty light, but they won't, I don't think they're gonna be as, um, as cool. Not that we're looking for really cool grays, but I, do you know what I mean? It's kind of a relative yeah. coolness. No, yeah. you know, I really like the looks of it and I'm just, down the line, you'll tell us the cost implications of choices. Yeah. So yeah, yes. thanks. Cool. I'm sure we'll look at this more, um, but I'll be interested on a Southern, uh, on this uh, um, facade, how much the, sh the building is going to shade the, the playground area and the outdoor area there. That's maybe, that's probably not for today, but at some point. Um, that is absolutely a study that we can do that will show at all times of the year how deep into the playground um, the building will shade, but um, the playground is significant uh, in terms of size, and uh, you can't really see here, but these darker yellow colored splotches are, are currently where the structured play, the actual mm -hmm. playgrounds themselves are, and they're a good distance away from the building, and the shadow of the building um, at lunchtime w would probably almost never be there, but we will document it and can tell you precisely. Great, thank you. Um, we're just going to do a full swing around the building. We've actually been asked a couple times what the east looks like, and we've never actually shown it just because it's sort of the back. But uh, as we circle around, you can see uh, it's a continuation of the same language. There will be a stair there, so it um, there will be some difference. Um, there will be glass at the end of the corridors that allows daylighting and wayfinding in the building. There will be an entrance. Um, And as we get to the south of the building, um, you can see solar shades on the classroom windows on the exterior. These are baguettes. Um, it's for one foot deep, thin spaced above viewing height. Uh, so looking outside, um, unless you are extremely tall, um, the uh, Sunshades would never be in your field of view. Um, looking up at the sky, they will somewhat, but they're probably the most effective means of reducing the glare that uh, I was talking about earlier. Um, there are many configuration size types materials that can be used for these shades, and these are just a first suggestion. Um, it could be one single shade that's deeper or a series of shades that are, are not as deep as shown here. Uh, designing that element is, is going to be a study unto itself, but this is what we're showing now to work with the window geometry that is in the direction we're moving and to, to get the effectiveness of the southern solar shade. Can I just add, um, mm -hmm. so the fin shape is called a baguette because it looks like a very elongated sort of you know, shape that's sort of pointy on the ends and rounder in the middle. And Tim, maybe after you finish your zoom around, if it's possible to look at one, just so people understand the term mm -hmm. is where the term is coming from, or what it means visually. Sure. If I can just add super quick, Tim, because I want to support, I just want to point out something that I, I did not, sorry, my, phone's ringing I don't even know where this is okay um the the baguettes that you're pointing out to so something that our study I'm sorry this is the first time just moved into this house and I don't know how to turn off the phone there we go sorry there not even calling us okay um the one of the things that our study found was that the single shade itself and you saw it in some of the graphics but I should have pointed it out a little bit more is that the single shade is doing a good job perhaps for the energy, but that from a glare standpoint, there's still sun coming in from above in below, right? And so we had a very um, engaging discussion with Danisco in terms of what can we do to make sure that, that the shade that for, for whatever shade we provided actually provides more glare control in the interior of the space. And so 
Uh, I'm very excited to see this baguette design that would effectively just break up that, that solar penetration into much smaller bits, which is far more tolerable and much more unlikely to lead to shade deployment. Think about it. The more you break up the shading is, I like to equate it to um, being say under a tree that is leafy, but also porous, right? Where you are getting some direct sunlight, but it actually doesn't bother you as much because there's a certain amount of protection too. And so just wanted to call that out in this design and, and say how this is, very nicely, a very nice response to the performance driven discussion we had. Paul? So when you were back on the Eastern exposure, I think that's what it was with the long that we hadn't seen before. And so you're saying that those windows will show, will be able to see all, all the way down the corridor to the other end of the building? Uh, not the entire length of the building, the academic. So if, um, Basically, there's a stair in the middle between the academic and the core. From that point on, uh, you would be able to see to the window. I mean, oh. you're, it will let light in. We don't have solar shades on these windows because um, it's it's basically a transition yeah. space. No, I, I was things. hoping we'd have a situation like at MIT, there's the infinite corridor, and there's like one day <laughs> a year when the sun goes all the way down, and we all everybody gather <laughs> and watch it. <laughs> on that one minute, one day a year. Oh, that would be very cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's possible. It's, <laughs> it's facing west, <laughs> facing east, right? Yeah. That's yeah. facing east. <laughs> In the winter, it will get uh, pretty far down that corner. Um, as we continue to circle around the building, uh, we're going to be what is now going to be the bus loop. Um, there is a door to the building here just at the start of the academic area or the start of the classrooms. Um, so, you know, the exact geometry of the drop-off loop and, and the logistics of it has to be designed, but uh, there will be a, a place where the buses can drop off and kids can go directly into their classroom. Um, as we move, there's the gym service area in between. And then we move back to the front of the building with um, a pull-off area for vans on the southern loop. And, and Tim whether is, the, Tim, is there also a door to the gym right in that glass area? Yes, there is a door to the gym right here. So if we were going to use a gym for community space um, on a day when the school wasn't in operation, polling area or something like that it one could figure out a way to get into just the gym would that be true that that would be true um and then you know we haven't designed the southern loop yet but we'll probably introduce some visitor parking to it or a connection that could be used intermittently to the northern parking so um, the sort of call it reorganization of the site circulation just happened and there are a lot of details that we have to work out but um uh Yes, the, the gym could be used as a separate entrance for voting or whatever, and and uh, we'll, we'll work out a way to put some visitor parking on this loop or access to it. Another thing, so southern drop-off loop for buses, other loop for cars, they sort of converge at the front exit, but don't actually cross in front of it. So this is not designed yet, but this um, sort of starts to hint at an opportunity that we'll have to have a large space right at the front door that is easily accessible from both bus loops, but is still traffic free. Um, so uh, students could gather there, drop off, um, but the entrance to the building could be uh, truly inviting, well designed uh, with ample space. And as we tilt up, um, you can get a better sense of that space. And, and one of the other um, points I believe Donna talked to with uh, Julio and Tam yesterday about is uh, you can't really see behind the trees, but we are showing some of the PV canopies over what is the car drop-off loop. So that could be semi-protected, um, but you know the exact location of all that is, is still has to be 
developed in a solar study with uh, our consultants. And, and just, you know, the massing is evolving. Um, all of the rooftop equipment will be pretty well consolidated in one area of the roof, not really visible from the ground. And that is... Kim, can you just go up just to respond to Paul's question and look at the north side of the building around? I mean, this is morning shading, right? So mm -hmm. just so he can see that. As this space gets developed, um, you know, the gathering area that we design, uh, you know, there's opportunity to place it in areas that will have you know, sun a majority of the year. So this is where we currently are with the design. There are lots of individual studies that we are doing that to develop the penetration further to uh, make this canopy um, an element that will speak to entrance um, where we can really introduce art and color um, further uh, study of the fenestration in the gym, lobby, um, music room, so that we can control glare and make the spaces beautiful. Um, but uh, we just wanted to give you an update on where we are. And uh, uh, Vivian, do you have any other design? Tim, things? can you move it around to the north? Did I miss it? Uh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. So, Paul, that's the morning condition, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I think um, this is the general form that the building and the roof lines are gonna take. We're still looking at ways to treat um, really some of the exterior walls. We'll try to bring some real samples of the lighter color masonry units. Um, Kathy, unfortunately you won't be there next time, but we'll certainly share images so that we can start to hone in on the actual materials that um, you'll see that we're going to start really massaging the glazing. Um, we want to have as much as possible to, again, bring in as much natural daylight, but we're going to need to balance that also with the program and what's going on behind it. For instance, the, the media center, you know, we show a lot of glass there. Um, we also understand there's a lot of books <laughs> that need to go in there. So um, as we kind of continue looking at um, the program requirements, some of the, the glazing, you know, it's going to change a little bit, but in terms of the lightness um, and the feel of the building, this is really the direction we're going. Vivian, yes. relative to the books, do you just want to say a couple words about the meeting with the librarians, which produced some important feedback? I think, Tim, do you want to give us a little yeah, no, summary? Um, yeah, so... Uh, as Vivian alluded, both the uh, Fort River and the Wildwood uh, have uh, rather large collections for an elementary school. Um, so uh, accommodating all of that will uh, be an exercise. Uh, part of that is because they have a collection in two languages due to the Common Updates program. Um, they also have, um, due to the existing library in both schools sort of being in the center of the circulation, the library um, houses a lot of functions that may ne not necessarily be in the library in the new building. It, it, it will still be the heart of the school where a lot of things happen, but it won't physically be the, the crossroads of the school anymore. So, uh, you know, we had a discussion working on what they do now and what will have to be accommodated in the future library. Um, and then we also had a discussion about the call it the secondary needs of the library. They do a lot of book repair and book things. Um, so they have workrooms and stuff like that. So we're gonna incorporate all of that into the design moving forward. I see Paul has his hand up. Yeah, I have two comments. One is um, this is an opportunity for librarians and everybody to think about what we want our libraries to look like in the um, you know 21st century, because to say, oh, we had this here and we wanna replicate it there. Um, when we had, when I had relocated an office, we did that, and the, 
we did it and we didn't do it. And when we didn't, when we did that, it was a mistake. So always take the opportunity in a situation like this to envision where you, what you think the ideal library should look like. And it's probably, it's probably not a place that is full of books, you know, <laughs> quite honestly, it's probably a lot of different things that libraries are doing now. And the second thing I want to say was, I really like what you've done with the massing of this building, the variability of the roof lines that you've introduced, the sort of different uh, materials that you have on, you know, on the cladding that really makes the building look interesting. And it's, it's basically just a, a rectangle, but with lots of different elements introduced to it that I find really um, appealing. And so I want to thank you for that and really kudos to you on this. I mean, I, I don't, I, w I don't think there's an option for this, but you know, the main entrance being in the shade, I think that's just by nature of the site. There's nothing we can do about that. And I do notice well, that it, it's the reverse at the end of the day. The yeah, end of the day yeah. is full light. And I do notice that you've given the Fort River sort of a uh, post climate change <laughs> <laughs> width there. <laughs> <laughs> the future of Fort River. <laughs> <laughs> it's Lake, it's Lake Como. <laughs> well, we'll have riverfront property, really. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Kathy, did you have a question earlier that I interrupted? Um, well, I just, uh, it's a question comment, but I'll start with a comment. I love, uh, with just what Paul said, I really like the angles in it. And I, kn I know you're working through the massing uh, and that some of those will change, you know, do the slants of the roof, but I, it makes it really interesting. And um, so I had a question and then I think Sean can speak for himself. I think Sean wasn't sure he liked this iron spot br brick darkness. And so I think you're able to show us this with, um, a red, you know, uh, whether it's traditional red or a light red, the stuff you had in Lexington where you had a mm -hmm. red brick. So I'm just saying what I wanted, to, the comment was, we don't have to make a decision now. We can look at, right. if we like the basic shapes and we like the idea of the accent colors, we could say, yeah. show me a red brick or yeah. keep this brick. So that was a comment. The question was when Alejandra showed us the best windows when they did all their things. The north side and the south side had different numbers on them. And I didn't write them down fast enough, but you would know, you know, it was like north number 10 and number four were the best for one thing. And the number south was three, four and 10 and then four, six and nine. So my question, my question was, does the window scheme need to be the same on the north and the south? Um, if there was a window scheme for the south that was better for for daylighting, because I personally probably wouldn't even notice if, and you know, on the classroom window side, if there was a slight variation, or if is it such a subtle difference that you pick the one that was in the the best, the crossovers where they're the fours, the fours or the tens were in the same. So it's just a question because I saw you put the, you know, you put these shades. And then with that on the south side, you've got that exterior um, ad. And I've seen those in Amherst College and UMass windows. Does that mean you don't need a shade inside the classroom? Does that provide just enough to take that slanted glare off or would you also have to shade? So it's a south side question of windows. Um, I will answer and then if anybody wants to add anything. Um, the big difference, currently we're showing the same geometry of the window openings on the north and south. The big difference between the north and south is the exterior sun shades, which do the work that um, create the difference between the north and south. That is not to say that we might not tweak the geometry on the north and south. Um, the And we did not pick the best performing, um, um, I, I forget the numbers, but the best performing was a much larger, not much, but it was larger and it would make it harder to achieve the overall um, window to wall ratio we want for the entire building and of course the glazing in the li library and the cafeteria to go down a little bit um so we think we chose the best balance 
Um, and then to add, there will absolutely be interior roller shades everywhere in the building, just because as 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 well as we design the exterior sunshades, we're we're never gonna get every situation. Uh, so, and also for things like projecting inside a classroom, you might want to just draw the shades. Yeah, I'll add winter sun angles are extremely challenging to uh, to manage in general, and so you definitely want to have that flexibility, even if you're if you're, you know, covering, ideally you have them and you only deploy them, you know, 20 days a year or something like that. But, um, but you'll need to have them on the south. John. Yeah, I'll just say Phoebe was right, seeing the, the darker brick broken up with the windows and with the, the other contrast, I, it, it looks much better um, from what I was thinking. So no, it, this looks good. Well, and I, you know, I want to suggest, um, I think it might be helpful. I'm not sure where we would put this, but um, it is possible to um, leave a palette of the proposed material somewhere that folks who aren't able to attend, attend the design subcommittee meetings could see it. Because I do agree with Kathy that it is in the photograph that was taken, it's, it's, not showing the richness of the color that is in that brick. So if that's helpful to people, I'm sure we could manage to acquire another sample of the brick board and, and share it, put it, you know, have it somewhere that folks could drop by and see it, so. Mike has his hand up. Yeah, I'm not trying to reassure, reassure Son or anyone else, but uh, as the person on our, you know, that design group that uh, wants the brightest colors, I preferred this in person compared to a lot of the other ones because there were a lot of bright colors that you can't see on a photograph of it, but in person you can see. So I think it's a great idea. I'm happy to host a, a brick panel if it makes sense, you know, or the building's open pretty good amount of time, you know, certainly I'm sure the town building would as well, but just, I think it really feels different seeing it. And, and I'm not Jonathan or Dennis goes, like I, I don't have design background, but just visually, it feels really different being there, um, seeing it live versus a photograph of it. And maybe just the type of material it is doesn't photograph in the same way because it's kind of specks of color that that come out. But I was like the the far end of wanting really, really bright, and I was pretty happy with it for what it's worth. So we're going to try to gather some real samples um, in terms of I think we're looking also at brick shapes and um, Norman is a uh, is a slightly longer uh, proportion than a modular brick but has it's it's really a nice um, shape. And so I think we're going to try to gather some of these materials in the colors that we're considering and we can bring them next week and actually leave them somewhere. So Mike, maybe, in your office or anywhere, um, you know, we'll we'll have it. We'll, we'll yeah, see how. We have a front entry in our in the district offices where you know it's a pretty public space. Anyone could you know come in for that and you know yeah. open throughout the day. So I'm happy to offer it if the town wants to do something different. That's fine too. But I'm happy to host. Great. The other thing is the meeting next week. The subcommittee is in the. So if any other committee members want to come it, during a, I, it's, I think it's going to be from one to three. I think we've settled that that's the time that room is actually available. If you want to stop by and look at them, but don't want to come to the meeting, you could stop by and look at them too. So we could both leave them and then have them to be seen. Jonathan has got his hand up. I remember to unmute myself. So I'm really pleased with with you know how the, the design has been developing over the last few weeks, and so I'm going to make a couple comments, but I don't want them to seem like I don't I like the direction it's going. I just I have some thoughts about um, additional things that, that the design team can explore. Um, in the view that we're looking at right now, I really like that that colored form um, that kind of encapsulates the um, the the the, the uh, kindergarten uh, rooms. If we, if, if you could move back to the to the front of the building, there's something about the boldness there. You, you get a, I, I think you get a nice pop of the color, and I don't feel that same kind of pop on this side. And I, in my head, I'm not sure if that's just because the the green kind of 
blends into the shadow in this particular view at this particular time of day, or if it's also possibly the form that the, the canopy, I like the way the roofs on the rest of it are working. The canopy itself seems a little staid and, and um, I don't know, it might be interesting to see some other forms or other ways that it, it could use the color uh, and, and, and pop a bit more. It's just, it's just a, a personal a personal comment, personal taste comment. Mm -hmm. uh, we and, absolutely agree. Uh, well, I'm just gonna it's say also, that. you've got the bright color on the south side and the darker color where Jonathan's doing, you know, the, you've got an orange over on the kindergarten in this. So it just the combination of the shape and the color may be yeah. doing that. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll look at different color options and combinations. And, you know, we also have just started talking about how we could really make that canopy um, more part of the building as opposed to something that sits on legs, right, on columns. So we're, we're looking at how we can actually reduce or eliminate uh, those col columns. And, you know, then it becomes really more of an extrusion of a, a building instead of something you just add on. So that's, that's coming. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help myself. I, I like to push occasionally. No, we love that. It's, 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 it's <laughs> like you hear our conversations in the office. Okay, I see Phoebe has her hand up. Um, I also, <clears throat> can you guys hear me? We yeah. can. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I also think that if we're talking, because we've had quite a few conversations about murals or artwork or that kind of stuff, um, that we may want to think about that at the same time that we're thinking about how bright to make these colors, where to put these colors, shape of, you know, um, shapes, all of that kind of stuff. Because I, I think we want to balance those. We don't, what we don't want to end up with is picking out all of these bright colors and then, you know, having a mural go on the wall and feel like, oh, geez, <laughs> you know, we made it, um, uh, they they clash or they, you know, those kinds of things. So um, I don't really know when the artwork piece of it comes into the design. Um, but if we're going to be at a stage soon where we look at how bright do we want these colors, we did really like that green is that green that we liked on the front of the school, how would that react to um, that we may want to balance those out a little bit at the same time. Yeah, no, understood. And I think we are not at the point of selecting artwork, but we are at the point of locating it because all of the things that you're talking about, we have to have a spot where the frame, for lack of a better word, is is worthy of the piece and it doesn't get diluted. It doesn't distract from the architecture. Um, the location and the opportunity for art is something that's absolutely part of the design right now. Tim, when you when you say the location of it, I I'm, I'm see Tammy is there, and I know she worked with the artists that did the current Fort River, uh, the big murals. Um, we might want to get some input from the art teachers, just because one choice was that side, that front entrance side you just showed where the name of the school was. Another choice you had showed us was that side of the gym. Another choice you showed us was that slant underneath the eave. You know, so it feels like there are two, po three possible outside choices, and they have more or less space to them. Um, so I just think the location also is important. But what would go on there? Like something smaller could go on a small space. Something bigger could go on a big space. Um, so that was just my comment on thinking through where it might go, but how big or small it might go. Um, getting some thoughts to that before we even know what the it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a really good point because even though we have a lot of surfaces, we cannot consider throwing artwork on every surface because it, it's like it's like just building the building. There's a balance of where you want your eye to go. And um, if there's too much, noise, then it diffuses everything, right? So I think as we move forward, we're gonna start 
using placeholders. And I think what we can do, Tim, is just to start um, mm -hmm. showing, you know, what does it mean if this is the big pattern here and this is a smaller pattern there? Um, I think as we start to look at it, we want to develop a story that we're telling with the artwork. And I don't know if that is part of the a subcommittee that um, will be developed for the, the public art piece, or if that's something that you want us to kind of start first. So just thinking out loud. Uh, I can come back um, to the next, There we have a bylaw on percent for art, and it would go through kind of a a commission getting public input, meaning broad public, but particularly mm -hmm. public like the users of the building. Um, so I'm my main comment right now is think of possible places, but not all just this place or that place. And yeah. we also have the, it doesn't have to be outside the building, it could be inside the right. building. Um, right. So just trying to think of it be and um, for the exterior, if it would help to have it on the outside, where it would help the most. Uh, and that's that, that's my comment, wasn't that I had a preference. Um, okay. It's just when you showed us that one by the side of the gym, it was pretty cool because you reproduced the Fort River one, <laughs> but I don't have a preference. So it, uh, so can I just chime in, Kathy? Process we have to go through, yeah. Yeah, I so I agree, and Kathy, I, I have shared those uh, procurement documents from Salem with you for a similar thing, but Vivian, to your question, I think the, the committee that would be created to do this should really start with a set of possible locations from the architects and perhaps some samples of what those have looked, might, the, some um, examples that they might look to for how to think about what the, those are. So it, I don't think it's super urgent, but I think that would be the, the thing that the committee would start with. So I'm just looking at the clock and wondering, Tim and Vivian, is this a good stopping point? Uh, this is. Okay. So, the um, there is a des design committee meeting subcommittee meeting next week and I will try to be there virtually just to listen I can't be there physically but it's in the town room and then we meet two weeks from today and we're on the 130 schedule that one right Margaret that's correct and we'll be bringing it back then two weeks after that which is November 4th the hope is we'll be focusing on the outdoor um, layout of fields, of parking lot, of traffic loops, of playgrounds, with an interaction with uh, people who have been really interested in what's going to happen to the community fields. So it'll be a whole piece. So that's just the upcoming meeting um, piece. And one thing I just want to do, be, if you want to show the agendas we've set up, we've posted them now, but Denisco worked with Margaret to say what's happening at each meeting. And it was sent to everyone and we're posting it. But as you're pulling that up, I, the one thing we need to do is I am not gonna be at the next, LM, the next full committee meeting, um, the uh, 21st. The 21st. Yep. I will physically not be able to be at that meeting or virtual. So someone has to volunteer to be an interim chair because we don't have anyone design designated to be that. Either volunteer or we have to vote on someone. Um, but someone has to realize that two weeks from now they're chairing the meeting. And I will take on the responsibility of getting the agenda posted. I can do that from anywhere in the world. <laughs> um, and I always you know, the agendas are getting simpler because we say continuing design discussion. But just if, if anyone wants to raise their hand to chair and you've seen, um, you, you don't have to, be, you can just introduce everyone, call their names and turn it over to Margaret, but someone has to chair. If anyone wants to raise their hand. <laughs> We're going to, uh, Jonathan's hand is up. Oh, and Mike put his hand up and took it down again. So Jonathan, I should, I should have been three seconds slower. 
<laughs> so, if you'd like me to do it, I'm happy to it's do like it. It's like a quiz game. No, I, 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 honestly, I don't mind doing it. I, I have done it before. Um, and uh, as long as I can mostly turn it over to Margaret and, uh, and the Dinesco team, <laughs> I'll be fine. Well, okay, in, so in general, we're trying to shift more of the facilitation of the meeting to me so Kathy can be more of a commenter. So that's totally fine. Okay, so has everyone agreed to that? I don't have to put it to a vote, correct, Paul? We just said interim chair, or do you want me to take a vote? I, I, I think we should vote, I think, and I'll move that uh, Jonathan Salvin serve as chair in any time of, um, of Kathy's absence. Okay, I second that. You noticed the way he worded that, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <yes>. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I second it. So I'm going to do a roll call vote in the order of the names that actually they appear on the, my uh, list. So Jonathan. Yes. Kathy's a yes. Uh, Sean. Yes. Angelica. Yes. Ben. Ben. Uh, come back to Ben. Mike. Yes, and thank you, Jonathan. And Phoebe. Yep. Yes. Tammy. Yes. And I didn't get a, a Simone. Yes. So the only one I didn't hear from is Ben. I don't know whether he or Sean or me. Oh, Sean. So oh, Sean, Paul. So I'm not doing a good. Oh, I see. Each time I call in a name, it goes down a list. Sorry, I should use the screen. Paul. Yes. Sean. I think you called on me, but I'll say yes again. Yeah. Did I Sorry. miss anyone? So just to confirm. So okay, it's so you. We have three absent, right? Rupert, Allison, and Alicia. That's correct. And then Ben didn't vote on this. So one not voting <laughs> right now. So he's trying. <laughs> he says yes. <laughs> ben, ben Very yes. creative. <laughs> ben is to yes. Ben is here and he is a yes. Well done. So I do, so um we have about close. So do, do you think that's enough for Bex meetings and then Margaret has sent it to everyone and we're posted in the packet. Yep. We're posting the content of the meetings next time. Is that all yep. right with everyone and the comments now? Okay, so we are open for public comments. I'm bringing Kathy, do you see anyone? There's two. There are two. Yes. There are two. Okay. So, Sorry, Bruce, I, you are with us. Um, I, think, I, I yes. um, had exactly the same question that Kathy had about the uh, window configurations on north and south because I did notice, as Kathy did, that whereas number six was the worst option for the north, it was uh, the south. It was the best option for the north. So I'm glad, Kathy, you asked that question because you got an immediate answer. And, and Tim, I thought it was a good one. Uh, it was really helpful to understand that, as uh, Ellie had said, the daylighting analysis is uh, rooted in all sorts of other. And that was an example of the uh, outside configurations actually being used to uh, um, add to the, your design decisions. I, I really like the direction that the uh, committee and, and the design team and the consultants and so forth are taking with this. I, I think that the seeming resolution for the traffic problem, which was kind of intractable almost in the uh, discussions over the site choice, seems to have uh, by design cleverness and the uh, uh, thoughtful uh, reflections of everybody, you know, the town staff and so forth involved, seems to making a, a, what seemed like an intractable problem much much less so so it's very very heartening i think to see how this is developing um my only comment like jonathan i'll add a personal comment for what it's worth i think uh, i'm not as attracted by the vertical striation of uh, tone on the gym i think it would be better if it was a single tone it's a little distracting in an otherwise nicely integrated building i very much agree with paul uh on that but uh I'd like you to consider whether that gym massing really needs to be a series of vertical black and white stripes, whether it wouldn't be better if it was just the uh, base mat, tied into the basic mass of the building. 
thank you again. Um, great job, very encouraging. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bruce. And then I see one other hand, uh, Rudy. I think I have allowed you to talk. Hi, Rudy Perkins from Amherst. I, I have to concur that design's really moving in a great direction. Um, it, it's, it's dramatic and still like sort of playful and I really like uh, where it's going. A um, couple of things. Um, I think we shouldn't be afraid to take color down into the horizontal plane of the sidewalk in some cases to emphasize main entrances as a possibility. I don't know if it would work. I thought the bus entrance might need a little more color. Um, you know, although kids will right away know where it is, unlike the adults who come to visit the school, um, it looks sort of like a service entrance kind of hidden and you might want to think of brightening that up um, and maybe tinting the, the portion of the sidewalk near that entrance to match the doors. Um, uh, the separation of the two entrances, I think, is a great idea, but I wouldn't lose the flexibility you have by two entrances to the school that can connect. So I hope that either the sidewalk in front of the west canopy is built to handle heavy trucks, emergency vehicles, or else there is a connection between the two loops that's a bollarded, maybe a lockable bollard or something. If emergency fire trucks or the like have to get around the building or one of the entrances is blocked or choked with traffic and you need to get around it, it would be good, I think, to connect the two loops somehow by vehicular means. And then, uh, oh, I had one more comment here. Um, I think on the West End, uh, thinking about the two spaces, the, the music room and the uh, admin panel as possible locations for art sites, and then carrying the some kind of color stream through along the canopy between those two art locations might be interesting if the murals had some bright color that could sort of thread uh, between those two spaces across the edge of the canopy. That would make a, a really bold um, West End and announce that West Entrance. And I think the, the gym wall needs to recede in importance as an art site now, given how you've done the building. So really good job, I think, so far. and. Um, Looking forward to more discussion on this. I think that the design picks of the colors, the iron spot does look a lot better in the sun. And if you put it out for public view, could you put it in a window maybe so people can see it in the sunlight um, at uh, Mike's location? Because it really does change the look of that brick. Um, so, oops, sorry about that. I of course got somebody calling me. So that's it, thanks very much. Thank you, Rudy. So are there any other comments, questions, uh, uh, Sean? So Kathy, if we don't do today, we do have a couple invoices that need to be approved. I don't know oh, if we're invoices. okay to go ahead and I do forgot it. The, but... Forgot invoices. Did I leave it off the agenda also? It, but we do you know, invoices. It's not, it's not on the agenda. Um, we can take them up if... Um, People have time, but we could leave them till the next meeting. If yeah, next is fine. Time. We just as long as we put it on there, and um, and we'll probably have we might have one more by then. Yeah, I forgot to do the standard line for invoices. Sorry. It's okay. Well, and I didn't catch it either, Kathy. So. Um. So does anyone other and 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 I do the that time slot on the design team, which the design subcommittee has been really fun, and to the extent anyone comes and wants to at the very end and wants to walk the where the building is I found that very helpful um we did we've done that once or twice and it just gives you a sense of oh this is where the front entrance would be and how far away from the current school is it um with the, also a sense of how much how big how big the space is you know how much space there is in, on that north end so I encourage people to at least walk the browns and Tammy walked it with me but I don't think I walked it accurately Tammy so we should get you know my it was my best guess so so I want to thank everyone and I uh, look forward to um, I'm sharing these pictures I'm over in Switzerland in case 
I don't think everyone knows, but I'm sharing them with my family over here um, and they all love it. So they've been following the project along the way. So <laughs> thank you very much. And I think we can say that the meeting is adjourned. Okay, 1021. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.